Hi, kids. Here's a picture of the book I want to read to you. It's Common Sense by Thomas Paine. One of the so much founder fathers that had the good sense that we needed to get this nation going. And it's small. Look how small it is. How tiny. So, I want to read you this because common sense, you know what common sense is, don't you? Common sense pretty much equals do no harm to yourself or anyone else. And that is common sense. Like, for instance, when you turn off a stove burner, don't touch it. I taught you that when you was little. Do not burn yourself by touching something after you turn the fire out. That's one thing. Tell me what else you think about it. Okay, it's 7.04. And I'm going to quit in about 10 minutes. I might have to make another one. And here it goes. And the introduction says, Perhaps the sentiments contained in the following pages are not yet sufficiently fashionable to procure them general favor. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a form formable outcry in defense of custom. But the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. As a long and violent abuse of power is generally the means of calling the right of it in question and in matters Matters, too, which might never have been thought of had not the sufferers been aggravated into the inquiry. And as the King of England hath undertaken in his own right to support the Parliament in what he calls theirs, and as the good people of this country are grievously oppressed by the combination, they have an undoubted privilege to inquire into the pretensions of both and equally to reject the usurpations of either. In the following sheets, the author has studiously avoided everything which is personal among ourselves. Compliments as well as censure to individuals make no part thereof. The wise and the worthy need not the triumph of a pamphlet and those whose sentiments are injudicious or unfriendly will cease of themselves unless too much pains are bestowed upon their conversion. See, I knew it had to do with pain and suffering. The cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. Many circumstances have and will arise which are not local but universal and through which the principles of all lovers of mankind are affected, and in the event of which their affections are interested. The laying of a country desolate with fire and sword, declaring war against the natural rights of all mankind, and extirpating the defenders thereof from the face of the earth, is the concern of every man to whom nature hath given the power of feeling, of which class, regardless of party censure, is the author. P.S. The publication of this new edition has been delayed with a view of taking notice, had it been necessary, of any attempt to refute the doctrine of independence. As no answer has yet appeared, it is now presumed that none will the time needful for getting such a performance ready for the public being considerably past. Who the author of this production is, is wholly unnecessary to the public, as the object for attention is the doctrine itself, not the man. Yet it may not be unnecessary to say that he is unconnected with any party, and under no sort of influence, public or private, but the influence of reason and principle. Philadelphia, February 14th, 1776. 
common sense of the origin and design of government in general with concise remarks of the English Constitution. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one encourages intercourse, the other creates distinctions. The first is a patron, the last a punisher. <coughs> Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an, in an intolerable one. For when we suffer our or are exposed to the same miseries by a government, which we might expect in a country without government. Our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we furnish the means by which we suffer. Government, like dress, is the badge of lost innocence. The palaces of kings are built on the ruins of the bowers of paradise. For were the impulses of conscience clear uniform and irresistibly obeyed, man would need no other lawgiver, but that is not being the case. He finds it necessary to surrender up a part of his property to furnish means for the protection of the rest, and this he is induced to do by the same prudence which in every other case advises him out of two evils to choose the least. Wherefore, security being the true design and end of government, it is unanswerable, follows, that whatever form thereof appears, most likely to ensure it to us, with the least expense and greatest benefit, is preferable to all others. In order to gain a clear and just idea of the design and end of government, let us suppose a small number of persons settled in some sequestered part of the earth, unconnected with the rest. They will then represent the first peopling of any country or of the world. In this state of natural liberty, society will be their first thought. A thousand motives will excite them there, thereto. The strength of one man is so unequal to his wants, and his mind so unfitted for perpetual solitude, that he is soon obliged to seek assistance and relief of another, who in his turn requires the same. Four or five united would be able to write, raise a tolerable dwelling in the midst of a wilderness, but one man might labor out the common period of life without accomplishing anything. When he has felt his timber, he could not remove it, nor erect it after it was removed. Hunger in the meantime would urge him from his work, and every different want call him a different way. Disease, nay, even misfortune would be death, for though neither might be mortal, yet either would disable him from living and reduce him to a state in which he might rather be said to perish than to die. Thus necessity, like a gravitating power, would soon form our newly arrived immigrants into society. The reciprocal blessing of which would supersede and render the obligations of law and government unnecessary while they remain perfectly just to each other. But as nothing but heaven is impregnable to vice, it will unavoidably happen that in proportion as they surmount the first difficulties of immigration, which bound them together in a common cause, they will begin to relax in their duty and attachment to each other, and this remissness 
will point out the necessity of establishing some form of government to supply the defect of moral virtue. And I will go to number two in a moment. Video 2 of Common Sense by Thomas Paine Some convenient tree will afford them a state house under the branches of which the whole colony may assemble to deliberate on public matters. It is more than probable <clears throat> that their first laws will have the title only of regulations and be enforced by no other penalty than public disesteem. In this first <clears throat> parliament, every man by natural right will have a seat. But as the colony increases, the public concerns will likew increase likewise, and the distance at which the members may be separated will render it too inconvenient for all of them to meet on every occasion, as at first, when their number was small, their habitations near, and the public concerns few and trifling. This will point out the convenience of their consenting to leave the legislative part <clears throat> to be managed by a select number chosen from the whole body, who are supposed to have the same concerns at stake which those who have a, who appointed them, and who will act in the same manner as the whole body would act were they present. If the colony continues increasing, it will become necessary to augment the number of the representatives, and that the interest of every part of the colony may be attended to. It will be found best to divide the whole into convenient parts, each part sending its proper number, and that the elected may never form to themselves an interest separate from the electors, Prudence will point out the propriety of having elections often, because as the elected might by that means return and mix again with the general body of the electors in a few months, their fidelity to the public will be secured by the prudent reflection of not making a rod for themselves, and as this frequent interchange will establish a common interest with every part of the community. They will mutually and naturally support each other. And on this, not on the unmeaning name of king, depends the strength of government and the happiness of the governed. Here then is the origin and rise of government, namely a mode rendered necessary by the inability of moral virtue to govern the world. Here too is the design and end of government. VIZ dot freedom and security. And however our eyes may be dazzled with snow, or our ears deceived by the sound, however prejudice may warp our wills, or interest darken our understanding, the simple voice of nature and of reason will say, It is right. I draw any idea of the form of government from a principle in nature, which no art can overturn that the more simple anything is, the less liable it is to be disordered, and the easier repaired when disordered. And with this maxim in view, I offer a few remarks on the much boasted Constitution of England, that it was noble for the dark and slavish times in which it was erected is granted. When the world was overrun with tyranny, the least therefrom was a glorious rescue, but that it is imperfect, subject to convulsions, and incapable of producing what it seems to promise is easily demonstrated. Absolute governments, though the disgrace of human nature, have this advantage with them, that they are simple. If the people suffer, they know the head from which their suffering springs. Know likewise the remedy, and are not bewildered by a variety of causes and cures. But the Constitution of England is so exceedingly complex that the nation may suffer for years together without being able to discover in which part the fault lies. Some will say in one and some in another, and every political physician will advise a different medicine. 
I know it is difficult to get over local or long-standing prejudices. Yet if we will suffer ourselves to examine the component parts of the English Constitution, we shall find them to be the base remains of two ancient tyrannies, compounded with some new Republican materials. First, the remains of monarchical tyranny in the person of the king. Secondly, the remains of aristocratical tyranny in the persons of the peers. Thirdly, the new Republican materials in the persons of the commons on whose virtue depends the freedom of England. The first two, by being hereditary, are independent of the people. Wherefore, in a constitutional sense, they contribute nothing towards the freedom of the state. To say that the Constitution of England is a union of three powers reciprocally checking each other is farcical. Either the words have no meaning or they are flat contradictions. To say that the commons is a check upon the king presupposes two things. First, that the king is not to be trusted without being looked after, or in other words, that a thirst for absolute power is the natural disease of monarchy. Secondly, that the commons, by being appointed for that purpose, are either wiser or more worthy of confidence than the crown. But as the same constitution which gives the commons a power to check the king by withholding the supplies, gives afterwards the king a power to check the commons by empowering him to reject their other bills, it again supposes that the king is wiser than those whom it is already supposed to be wiser than him, a mere absurdity. There is something exceedingly ridiculous in the composition of monarchy. It first excludes a man from the means of information, yet empowers him to act in cases where the highest judgment is required. The state of a king shuts him from the world, yet the business of a king requires him to know it thoroughly. Wherefore the different parts, unnaturally opposing and destroying each other, prove the whole character to be absurd and useless. Some writers have explained the English Constitution thus. The king, say they, is one, the people, another. The peers are a house in behalf of the king, the commons in behalf of the people. <clears throat> but this hath all the distinctions of a house divided against itself, and through the expressions be pleasantly arranged, yet when examined, <clears throat> they appear idle and ambiguous. It will always happen that the nicest construction that words are capable of when applied to the description of something which either cannot exist or is too incomprehensible to be within the compass of description will be words of sound only and though they may amuse the ear they cannot inform the mind for this explanation includes a previous question this, how came the king by a power which the people are afraid to trust and always obliged to check? Such a power could not be the gift of a wise people, neither can any power which needs checking be from God. Yet the provision which the Constitution makes supposes such a power to exist. But the provision is unequal to the task. The means either cannot or will not accomplish the end. And the whole affair is fellow deceit, for as the greater weight will always carry up the less, and as all the wheels of a machine are put into motion by one, it only remains to know which power in the Constitution has the most weight, for that will govern, and through the others, or a part of them, may clog, or, as the phrase is, check the rapidity of its motion. Yet, so long as they cannot stop it, their endeavors will be ineffectual. The first moving power will at last have its way, and what it wants in speed is supplied by time. That the crown is this overbearing part in the English Constitution needs not be mentioned, and that it derives its whole consequence merely from being the giver of places and pensions is self-evident. Wherefore, 
though we have and wise enough to shut and lock a door against absolute monarchy, we at the same time have been foolish enough to put the crown in possession of the key. And now we'll go to video number three. Video number three, Common Sense by Thomas Paine. The prejudice of Englishmen in favor of their own government by king, lords, and commons arises as much or more from national pride than reason. Individuals are undoubtedly safer in England than in some other countries, but the will of the king is as much the law of the land in Britain as in France, with this difference that instead of proceeding directly from his mouth, it is handed to the people under the most formidable shape of an act of Parliament. For the fate of Charles I hath only made kings more subtle, not more just. Wherefore, laying aside all national pride and prejudice in favor of modes and forms, <clears throat> the plain truth is, that is wholly owing to the constitution of the people and not to the constitution of the government that the crown is not as oppressive in England as in Turkey. <clears throat> An inquiry into the constitutional errors in the English form of government is at this time highly necessary for as we are never in a proper condition of doing justice to others while we continue under the influence of some leading partiality so neither are we capable of doing it to ourselves <clears throat> while we remain fettered by the obstinate, obstinate prejudice. And as a man who is attached to the prostitute is unfitted to choose or judge of a wife, so any preposition in favor of a rotten constitution of government will disable us from discerning a good one. Of monarchy and hereditary successions. Mankind being originally equals in the order of creation, the equality could only be destroyed by some subsequent circumstance. The distinctions of rich and poor may in a great measure be accounted for, and that without <clears throat> having recourse to the harsh, ill-sounding names of oppression and avarice, Oppression is often the consequence, but seldom or never the means of riches. And through avarice will preserve a man from being necessitously poor. It generally makes him too timorous to be wealthy. <clears throat> but there is another and greater distinction for which no truly natural or relig religious reason can be assigned, and that is the distinction of men into kings and subjects. Male and female are the distinctions of nature, good and bad the distinctions of heaven. But how a race of men came into the world so exalted above the rest and distinguished like some new species is worth inquiring into. And whether they are the means of happiness or of misery to mankind. In the early ages of the world, according to the scripture chronology, there was no kings the consequences of which there was were no wars. It is the pride of kings which throw mankind into confusion. Holland without a king hath enjoyed more peace for this last century than any of the monarchical governments in Europe. Antiquity favors the same remark, for the quiet and rural lives of the first patriarchs has a happy something in them which vanishes away when we come to the history of Jewish royalty. Government by kings was first introduced into the world by the heathens, from whom the children of Israel copied the custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set foot for the promotion of adultery. The heathens paid divine honors <clears throat> to their deceased kings, and the Christian world hath improved on the plan by doing the same to their living ones. How impious is the title of sacred majesty applied to a worm who in the midst of his splendor is crumbling into dust. 
as the exalting one man so greatly above the rest cannot be justified on the equal rights of nature, so neither can it be defended on the authority of Scripture. For the will of the Almighty, as declared by Gideon and the prophet Samuel, expressly disapproves of government by kings. All anti monarchical parts of Scripture have been very smoothly glossed over in monarchical governments, but they undoubtedly merit the attention of countries which have their government yet to form. Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, is the scriptural doctrine of courts. Yet it is no support of monarchical government, for the Jews at that time were without a king and in a state of vassalage to the Romans. Near 3,000 years passed away from the Mosaic account of the creation till the Jews under a national delusion requested a king. Till then their form of government, except in extraordinary cases, where the Almighty interposed, was a kind of republic administered by a judge and the elders of the tribes. Kings they had none, and it was held sinful to acknowledge any being under that title but the Lord of hosts. And when a man seriously reflects on the adulterous homage which is paid to the persons of kings, he need not wonder that the Almighty ever jealous of his honor, should disprove of a form of government which so impiously evades the prerogative of heaven. Monarchy is ranked in scripture as one of the sins of the Jews, for which a curse and reserve is denounced against them. The history of that transaction is worth attending to. The children of Israel being oppressed by the Midianites Gideon marched against them with a small army, and victory through the divine interposition decided in his favor. The Jews, elate with success in attributing it to the generalship of Gideon, proposed making him a king, saying, Rule thou over us, thou and thy son, and thy son's son. Here was temptation in its fullest extent, not a kingdom only, but a hereditary one. But Gideon in his piety of soul replied, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Words need not be more explicit. Gideon doth not decline the honor, but denieth their right to give it. Neither doth he com compliment them with invented declarations of his thanks. But in the positive style of a prophet, charges them with disaffection to their proper sovereign, the King of Heaven. And now we'll go to video number four. Video number four, Common Sense by Thomas Paine. About 130 years after this, they fell again into the same error. The hankering which the Jews had for the adulterous customs of the heathens as something exceedingly unaccountable. But so it was that the laying hold of the misconduct of Samuel's two sons, who were entrusted with some sec secular concerns, they came in an abrupt and clamorous man manner to Samuel, saying, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And here we cannot but observe that their motives were bad, that they might be like unto other nations, etc. The heathens were as their true glory laid in being as much unlike them as possible. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. 
Now therefore hearken unto their voice, albeit protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them, i.e. not of any particular king, but the general manner of the kings of the earth, whom Israel was so eagerly copying after. And notwithstanding the great <clears throat> distance of time and difference of manners, the character is still in fashion. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This shall be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. This description agrees with the present mode of impressing men. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground, and to read his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots, and he will take your daughters to be confessionaries, <clears throat> and to be cooks, and to be bakers. This describes the expense and luxury, as well as the oppression of kings, and he will take your fields, and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants, and he will take the tenth of your feed, and of your vineyards, and give them to his officers, and to his servants, by which we see that bribery, corruption, and favoritism are the standing vices of kings, and he will take the tenth of your men's servants, and your maid servants, and your goodliest young men, and your asses, and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants, and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. This accounts for the continuation of monarchy. Neither do the characters of the few good kings which have lived since either sanctify the title or blot out the sinfulness of the origin, the high economium, given of David takes no notice of him officially as a king, but only as a man after God's own heart. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, and we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. And Samuel continued to reason with them, but to no purpose. And he said before them their ingratitude, but all would not avail. And seeing them fully bent on their folly, he cried out, I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, which then was a punishment, being in the time of wheat harvest, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added to our sins this evil to ask a king. These portions of scripture are direct and positive. They admit of no equivocal construction, that the Almighty hath entered his protest against monarchical government is true or that the scripture is false and a man hath good reason to believe that there is as much of kingcraft as priestcraft in withholding the scripture from the public in popish countries for monarchy in every instance is the popery of government and we will go to video five in a moment when people find out i'm doing videos in here Okay, video number five, Common Sense by Thomas Paine. To the evil of monarchy we have added that of hereditary succession, and as the first is a degradation and lessening of ourselves, so the second claimed as a matter of right is an insult and an imposition on posterity. For all men being originally equals, no one by birth could have a right to set up his own family in perpetual preference to all others forever. And though himself might deserve some decent degree of honors of his contemporaries, yet his descendants might be far too unworthy to inherit them. 
One of the strongest natural proofs of the folly of hereditary rights in kings is that nature disproves it. Otherwise, she would not so frequently turn it into ridicule by giving mankind an ass for a lion. Secondly, as no man at first could possess any other public honors than were bestowed upon him, <clears throat> so the givers of these honors could have no power to give away the right of posterity, and though they might say, We choose you for our head, they could not, without manifest injustice to their children, say, that your children and your children's children shall reign over ours forever, because such an unwise, unjust, unnatural compact might, perhaps, in the next succession, put them under the government of a rogue or a fool. Most wise men in their private settlements have ever treated hereditary right with contempt. Yet, it is one of those evils which, when once established, is not easily removed. Many submit from fear, others from superstition, and the most more powerful part shares with the king of the plunder of the rest. This is supposing the present race of kings in the world to have had an honorable origin, whereas, whereas it is more than probable that could we take off the dark covering of antiquity, and trace them to their first rise, then we should find the first of them nothing better than the principal ruffian of some restless gang, whose savage manners of preeminence and subtly obtained him the title of chief among plunderers, and who by increasing in power and extending his depredations overawed the quiet and defenseless to purchase their safety by frequent contributions. Yet his electors could have no idea of giving hereditary right to his descendants, because such a perpetual exclusion of themselves was incompatible with the free and unrestrained principles they professed to live by. Wherefore, hereditary succession in the early ages of monarchy could not take place as a matter of claim, but as something casual or complimentary. But as few or no records were ex extant in those days, and traditionary history stuffed with fables, it was very easy, after the lapse of a few generations, to trump up some superstitious tale, conveniently timed. Mammomet liked to cram hereditary right down the throats of the vulgar. Perhaps the disorders which threatened or seemed to threaten on the decease of a leader and the choice of a new one, for elections among ruffians could not be very orderly, induced many at first to favor hereditary pretensions, by which means it happened, as it hath happened since, that what at first was submitted to as a convenience was afterward claimed as a right. England, since the conquest, hath known some few good monarchs, but grown beneath a much larger number of bad ones, Yet no man in his senses can say that their claim under William the Conqueror is a very honorable one. A French bastard landing with an armed bandita and establishing himself king of England against the consent of the natives is in plain terms a very paltry, rascally original, and certainly hath no divinity in it. However, it is needless to spend much time in exposing the folly of hereditary right if there are any so weak as to believe it let them promiscuously worship the ass and lion, and welcome. I shall neither copy their humility nor disturb their devotion. Yet I should be glad to ask how they suppose kings came at first. The question admits but of three answers, viz. either by lot or by election or by usurpation. <clears throat> If the first king was taken by lot, it establishes a precedent, precedent for the next, which excludes hereditary succession. Saul wa was by lot, yet the succession was not hereditary, neither does it appear from that transaction that there was any intention it ever should. If the first king of any country was by election, that likewise establishes a precedent for the next. 
For to say that the right of all future generations is taken away by the act of the first electors in their choice, not only of a king, but of a family of kings forever, hath no parallel in or out of scripture, but the doctrine of original sin, which supposes the free will of all men lost in Adam, and from such comparison, and it will admit of no other, hereditary succession can derive no glory. For as in Adam all sinned, and as in the first electors all men obeyed, as in the one all mankind were subjected to Satan, and in the other to sovereignty, as our innocence was lost in the first, and our authority in the last, and as both disable us from reassuming some former state and privilege, it unanswerably follows that the original sin and hereditary succession are parallels, dishonorable rank and glorious connection yet the most subtle sophist cannot produce a juster simile as to usurpation <clears throat> no man will be so hardy as to defend it and that William the Conqueror was an usurper is a fact not to be contradicted the plain truth is that the antiquity of English monarchy will not bear looking into <clears throat> but it is not so much the absurdity of the evil of hereditary succession which concerns mankind. Did it ensure a race of good and wise men, it would have the seal of divine authority. But as it opens the door to the foolish, the wicked, and the improper, it hath in it the nature of oppression. Men who look upon themselves born to reign and others to obey soon grow insolent selected from the rest of mankind their minds are easily poisoned by importance and the world they act in differs so material materially from the world at large that they have but little opportunity of knowing its true interests and when they succeed to the government are frequently the most ignorant and unfit of any throughout the dominions and we will go to the next video number six video number six common sense by Thomas Paine another evil which attends hereditary succession is that the throne is subject to be possessed by a minor at any age all which time the Regency acting under the cover of a king have every opportunity and inducement to betray their trust the same national misfortune happens when a king wore out with age and infirmity enters the last stage of human weakness. In both these cases, the public becomes a prey to every miscreant who can tamper successfully with the follies, <clears throat> either of age or infancy. The most possible plea which hath ever been offered in favor of hereditary succession is that it preserves a nation from civil wars, and were this true, it would be weighty. Whereas, it is the most barefaced falsity ever imposed upon mankind. The whole history of England disowns the fact. <clears throat> Thirty kings and two minors have reigned in the distracted kingdom since the conquest, in which time there had been, including the revolution, no less than eight civil wars and nineteen rebellions. Wherefore, instead of making for peace, it makes against it and destroys the very foundation it seems to stand on. The contest for monarchy and succession between the houses of York and Lancaster laid England in a scene of blood for many years. Twelve pitched battles besides skirmishes and sages were fought between Henry and Edward. Twice was Henry prisoner to Edward, who in his turn was a prisoner to Henry. And so uncertain is the fate of war and the temper of a nation, when nothing but personal matters are the ground of a quarrel, that Henry was taken in triumph from a prison to a palace, and Edward obliged to fly from a palace to a foreign land. Yet as sudden transitions of temper are seldom lasting, Henry in his turn was driven from the throne, and Edward recalled to succeed him the Parliament always following the strongest side. This contest began in the reign of Henry the Sixth, 
and was not entirely extinguished until Henry the Seventh, in whom the families were united, including a period of 67 years, viz. from 1422 to 1489. In short, monarchy and succession have laid, not this or that kingdom only, but the world in blood and ashes. Tis a form of government which the word of God bears testimony against, and blood will attend it. If we inquire into the business of a king, we shall find that in some countries they have none, and after sauntering away their lives without pleasure to themselves or advantage to the nation, withdraw from the scene and leave their successors to tread the same idle round. In absolute monarchies, the whole way <clears throat> of business, civil, and military lies on the king. The children of Israel in their request for a king urge this plea that he may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. But in countries where he is neither a judge nor a general, as in England, a man would be puzzled to know what is his business. The nearer any government approaches to a republic, the less business there is for a king. It is somewhat difficult <coughs> to find a proper name for the government of England. Sir William Meredith calls it a republic, but in its present state it is worthy of the name. <coughs> Because the corrupt influence of the crown by having all the places in its disposal has so effectually swallowed up the power and eaten out the virtue of the House of Commons, the Republican part in the Constitution, that the government of England is nearly as monarchical as that of France or Spain. Men fall out with names without understanding them, for it is the Republican and not the monarchical part of the Constitution of England which Englishmen glory in, this the liberty of choosing a House of Commons from out of their own body, and it is easy to see that when Republican virtue fails, slavery ensues. <coughs> Why is the Constitution of England sickly? But because monarchy hath poisoned the Republic, the crown has engrossed the Commons. In England a king hath little more, hath little more to do than to make war and give away places, which in plain terms is to impoverish, impoverish the nation and set it together by the ears. A pretty business indeed for a man to be allowed 800,000 sterlings a year for and worshipped in the bargain. A more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God than all the crown ruffians that have ever lived. <coughs> <coughs> Thoughts on the present state of American affairs. In the following pages I offer nothing more than simple facts, plain arguments, and common sense, and have no other preliminaries to settle with the reader than that he will divest himself of prejudice and prepossession, and suffer his reason and his feelings to determine for themselves that he will put on, or rather that he will not put off, the true character of a man, and generously enlarge his views beyond the present day. Volumes have been written on the subject of the struggle between England and America. Men of all ranks have embarked on the controversy from different motives and with various designs, but all have been ineffectual and the period of debate is closed. <clears throat> Arms as a last resource decide the contest. The appeal was the choice of the king and the continent has accepted the challenge. It has been reported of the late Mr. Pelham, who, though an able minister, was not without his faults, that on his being attacked in the House of Commons on the score that his measures were only of a temporary kind, replied, They will last my time. Should a thought so fatal and unmanly possess the colonies in the present contest, the name of ancestors will be remembered by future generations with detestation. <clears throat> the sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the affair of a city, a country, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent, of at least one-eighth part of the habitable globe. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Prosperity was virtually involved in the contest, and will be more or less affected even to the end of time by the proceedings now. Now is the seed time of continental union, faith, and honor. 
the least fracture now will be like a name engraved with the point of a pen on a tender rind of a young oak. The wound will enlarge with the tree and prosperity read it in full grown characters. <clears throat> By referring the matter from argument to arms, a new era for politics is struck. A new method of thinking has arisen. All plans, proposals, and etc. prior to the 19th of April to the commencement of the hostilities are like the almanacs of the last year, which, though proper then, are superseded and useless now. Whatever was advanced by the advocates on either side of the question then terminated in one and the same point, viz. a union with Great Britain. The only difference between the parties was the method of effecting it, the one proposing force, the other friendship. But it hath so far happened that the first hath failed, and the second have, has withdrawn her influence. And we'll go to the next one.